Well, hello, good evening, and welcome to this very special event. I've got Alex from Nuggets News on as well, and uh, we're going to have some fun tonight um, talking about some very important conversations to do with Bitcoin. Let me just bring Alex back. There we go. Um, we've got um, 283 on the stream at the moment. That's pretty good. And uh, a lot of conversation in the chat. As with all of these things, it's always hard to keep an eye on everything. But uh, um, So I think, um, Alex, good face to start. There may be some people who don't actually know, or that they should know, about you and your channel. So just give us the 30-second uh, version, would you? Sure thing. Well, I guess, uh, first of all, thanks for having me, Martin. And I'm sure a few of your audience uh, might already know me and uh, you've given us plenty of value each month when we do our housing update. So hopefully I can return the favor tonight and I know there's lots of questions about Bitcoin. So 30 second version of uh, Nuggets News. My background was actually in pharmacy, which I left that industry. Um, I ne didn't like the way that things were going there and there was a similar story when I went down the uh, rabbit hole after losing money in the GFC. 12 years ago now. I didn't like the way that finance was uh, looking like it was going to go with money printing and uh, all that sort of thing, the bailouts, as most of your audience will know. Uh, so I really taught myself everything um, I could about finance and economics, watched all those documentaries, and um, that led me to Bitcoin in 2012. It was $10 at the time and you couldn't buy any in Australia. And I just sort of went from there, kept learning more and more about finance, investing, options, derivatives, as well as cryptocurrency. And then the Bitcoin space really took off in 2017. So that's when I started making videos to help people understand finance, economics, uh, but particularly Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, uh, blockchain technology. And uh, the rest is history, Martin, after we had that, that big bubble that popped in 2017. And we're just sort of coming out of it now. I guess the space is really matured and we're going to see which businesses and which cryptocurrencies are the real deal. Great. Thanks for that. And it's worth saying, I think, that uh, as uh, Bitcoin has gone on, you know, the, the, the truth is that economics and the digital currency world has come together, right? So it might have been a little sideshow earlier on, but as things have developed, it's definitely um, becoming much more convergent. And with everything else that's going on at the moment, um, it's much more important than ever before to understand precisely how the digital world connects with the physical and uh, economic world. Oh, absolutely. So each um, Sunday night, we do a bit of a wrap-up of all the world sort of finance news and as well as mainly cryptocurrency news. But people used to say, why do you cover some of these um, finance headlines about negative interest rates or money printing? And all of a sudden in 2020 or even a little bit last year, it's just the main thing that is now talked about in the crypto space as well. So it was just the joining of those dots. A lot of the reasons why um, I'm bullish on Bitcoin, which we'll get to later, are because of what's happening in world finance and um, you know all this money printing negative interest rates. So you have to understand how the world of money and finance works to really truly appreciate Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Yeah, and that's, I think, the important thing. And that's why there's a very important intersection. And that's why this is a really good conversation. So um, let's just um, start at the beginning, right? We had the halving. Now, some people on the channel will know all about the halving. But let's just assume that you're a newbie on this, Alex. Just take us through what is a halving? Why is it important? And uh, what is the implication of the halving? Sure thing. So once again, to understand why it's important, it's important to understand what inflation is in the world of money, where every year more money is created. And if you create lots of money, like in Venezuela or Zimbabwe, you have that hyperinflation, you have a really high inflation rate. Now, Bitcoin started off uh, with an inflation rate of around 16%, so fairly high. And that's um, that lasts for four years. And every four years, uh, that halves. So it goes down to 8% and then down to 4%. As of yesterday, it dropped down to 2%. So to begin with, you have to have a higher inflation to basically reward participants and try and get them involved. And that's taking a step back further. The reward, the people that get the inflation are the miners. So when I send Martin a Bitcoin transaction, it gets broadcast over the network. Uh, anyone is able to try and compete to solve a hard math problem. And whoever um, solves that first, they get to add a block of information to the to blockchain, the chain of blocks, which is just like a database that everyone keeps. So all the miners, all those computers out there, everyone has a record 
of the ledger of all the transactions of all the blocks in the right order. Um, those miners, they get to put all the transactions that come to them from all around the globe. The one that I sent to Martin included, they put that in a block uh, and it takes about 10 minutes to solve that math puzzle. And so that lasts for four years, that 16% inflation rate, and then it drops down. So basically we need an inflation rate and we need some sort of financial reward for these people to, uh, it's called mining, mine all these transactions, just process all the transactions you can think of that as. So yesterday, yes, it has dropped down to 2%, and that's a pretty important number because central banks around the world target 2 to 3% inflation. That's what they say. But as you know, and you've probably covered, Martin, uh, real inflation rates can be a lot higher than that. You know, some people say 7 or 8%. In certain countries, we already have way higher inflation and hyperinflation. So the aim of Bitcoin is to have the world's um, hardest or soundest money I think gold has an inflation rate of around 2% as well. But the argument is, well, what makes things uh, valuable? And it's their scarcity to some degree. So if everyone could just go and pick up gold in their backyard and there was heaps of it, you know, supply and demand would say the price goes down. So similar thing to any commodity, any currency, um, and Bitcoin is becoming more scarce. And over time, that's why I believe it will keep going up in price just because it's relative to all these other fiat currencies around the world. Right. And just to be clear, the halving essentially relates to how much a miner earns when they actually process the Bitcoin, right? So they were being remunerated at one level, they're now being remunerated at half the level previously. Yes. Yeah, so the, the inflation rate uh, that dropped yesterday from 4% down to 2%, that is the number of Bitcoins in total circulation that get dispersed to all the computers. So if you've got more computers than me, Martin, the chances are that you'll mine more Bitcoins than me. So it's very much like a, a TATS lotto when people join the syndicate at work to increase their chances of actually winning and mining that block and solving that, that problem. And so that's why you hear things like uh, China has a lot of the cryptocurrency mining they've got a lot of the mining pools, like the syndicates that everyone joins. So you and I can join that pool with our computers from home and we can join in that syndicate and increase our chances of getting the rewards, but we have to split those rewards. Right. And the point there is that at some point, you know, people might actually think that it's not worth the effort anymore simply because the remuneration is somewhat low. And I read some articles today suggesting that at the level that we've now got to, some of those miners might decide to go and do other things because essentially it's now not as profitable as it was. Yeah, that's it's a really important uh, question or uh, topic to understand, but it is the same as any commodity. So people often say, oh, if gold never fell to... $1,200 an ounce. So I remember quite clear, uh, clearly people were saying if silver ever, ever fell to $26 an ounce, it's below the cost of mining and they wouldn't be profitable. But the reality is that those silver mines just go broke or they go offline, the ones that can't afford to. And it's the same in the Bitcoin world. There'll be a lot of miners where they have higher power costs like in Australia and they will go offline because hydro dams in China or people with solar or renewable energy setups that basically have free power, you know, we can't compete with them. So their cost of mining, once they factor in the cost of their power and the cost of their computers, their mining equipment, that's basically the, the main two costs. And so a lot of miners in China that have big professional setups, free power and the best equipment, they will still be profitable. But th there's a big but to the end of all this because a few years ago, Bitcoin was only a few dollars. So why was it profitable to mine back then? And it's not profitable for a lot of people to mine now when it's thousands of dollars. And the difficulty uh, just So it has a built-in algorithm so that the difficulty in the inflation rate stays the same over that four-year period until the inflation rate is actually meant to you know, change and decrease. And the reason for that is as Bitcoin grows in popularity, Martin says, well, I'm, I want to solve that maths equation as much as I can. And we know that it's, it's this difficult to do. If I have one computer, it might solve it every 10 minutes. So Martin goes out and buys 10 more computers and all of a sudden he's solving that problem 10 times as fast. And he actually might get a lot more Bitcoins for a short period of time. But every two weeks, the difficulty adjusts. So after that two-week period, it would adjust up um, 
to basically reach a new equilibrium because it knows Martin has 10 more computers and it brings it back into sync. So that block, the maths equation that we're all trying to solve on average, it'll get solved every 10 minutes. So there are some times when it takes 15 minutes, other times where it takes 25. And we look at that average and if we're mining blocks too fast, there's too many computers that have joined the network, uh, the algorithm, the software automatically adjusts and, and will make it a little bit more difficult to solve that maths equation. Now at the moment, if price is going down and some miners are going broke, it'll adjust uh, the other way around. It'll make it easier because it knows that some miners have fallen offline. Right. Now, there's a couple of interesting comments in the in this section here. One of them from Ron says, I honestly still don't understand what Bitcoin is and how it actually works. <laughs> so um, do you want to have a go at that one, Alex? Or is that, um, you know, effectively starting to define the universe from a fairy cake <laughs> quote to Doug, Douglas? Um, it's it's very easy, but to truly appreciate it, it's actually very, very hard. So if you have no knowledge of if you can't tell someone where money comes from and you know what inflation rates are, then it starts to get hard to truly appreciate what Bitcoin is. But in the simplest sense, it is just a digital currency. And most currencies these days are already going digital. So everyone understands money when they see their gold coins or their paper notes or we have a check. And then you just take money further. Once we had computers, we started to use money online. Now, in banks, a lot of people still picture it as money being backed by real money in the bank, in the vault or, or gold or something in their mind. They think, well, I've got money. It's in the bank. It lives there. And when I make a payment online, you know, that just gets taken out from those reserves to another bank, you know, in the physical sense. But these days and for many, many decades now, money has not been backed by anything other than the faith and the trust in governments and central banks and those that are creating it. So when people say, well, Bitcoin's not backed by anything, no, no currency in the world is backed by anything. But of course, people are going to trust a government more, depending on what country you're in, Martin. So you're not going to trust the Venezuelan government very much with their money, with the printing and the inflation. So it's all a scale of how much do you trust your government and the money printing. And what's happening at the moment, you know, the US are printing trillions. Australia has started doing QE. So I think one by one, every country is printing more money and devaluing their currency. So there's more and more units of the Aussie dollar or the US dollar or, you know, the Argentinian peso. And Bitcoin has that set amount of units that there can ever be. You might have heard that, that there can only ever be 21 million Bitcoins. Um, and the path that we get there, um, that inflation rate gets less and less. So the curve, um, you know, flattens over time. So what is Bitcoin? Well, it is just a digital currency. There's so many other currencies out there. You can use the Aussie dollar digitally online with your websites or your bank payments, whatever it is. This is just another currency. Um, it lives entirely online. Anyone can use the network. Anyone can download the program. You can help mine the Bitcoins and process the transactions if you buy one of the mining computers that, that can do that. Or you can download the app or the software wallet and have a Bitcoin on your computer. So it's open to everyone. There's no one person in control. Everyone sort of shares responsibility uh, and tries to solve those problems to process the transactions. Everyone keeps a ledger of all those transactions. So that's why you hear things like it's open source, it's decentralized. Even in US Congress, they say there's no one we can call into Congress when they call in Mark Zuckerberg when Facebook came out with their Libra cryptocurrency. So that's one of the things that I think makes Bitcoin very unstoppable, that you can't stop a digital currency that lives on everyone's computer everywhere around the world. And the, so the, key, the key thing to understand is, unlike other currencies that are controlled by governments, right, Bitcoin is not controlled in the same way. It's a decentralized, devolved, um, effectively, de you know, the chains are the, the thing that holds it together, but those are virtual. And so therefore it is beyond the control of standard banking control systems and government control systems. And that's why a lot of people quite like Bitcoin. Yes. I, th I think the... I was going to say the most important point is that it is fixed in supply compared to all these other currencies around the world that are going into the trillions and trillions in debt. And money is about to go one step further from the digital Aussie dollar in your PayPal account or your Commonwealth Bank account. 
they're now actually talking about making central bank digital currencies. So digital representations of these that are similar to cryptocurrencies, but not quite the same as Bitcoin. So at that stage, which is honestly probably only 12 or 24 months away now, Martin, at that stage, you have a choice between government cryptocurrencies or government digital currencies, and they'll just be printed and printed and devalued. And then you know that you've got Bitcoin, something that is um, you know, finite, it's set in the rules, no one can change that. There's only ever going to be 21 million of those. So if you own 10%, you always are going to own 10%. Uh, and I just think that's why it's going to continue to go up in price because relative is just always becoming more scarce to every other fiat currency uh, on the globe, which governments are printing more and more of. Yeah. Well, certainly governments are busy printing at the moment, as uh, we saw fr from the Fed. I, I guess one of the questions that somebody's asked there is um, why the 21 million? Why, you know, why was a finite? It's really built in to the fundamental principle of Bitcoin, isn't it, Alex? That, you know, we want to have a finite supply. It's a bit like gold. You know, if you had an infinite supply, then it's worthless. But if you have a limited supply, then essentially it means that um, there's, there's a chance that there is value attached to it. And I guess the other point to, to make is that Bitcoin has a, a, a financial relationship to the dollar and the Aussie dollar and those sort of things because people are transferring funds from one to the other and back again. And um, whilst you can trade uh, in Bitcoin, most people, I think, probably think of it as a mechanism to sort of trade and exchange, but then move it back. And that's something else that people need to be aware of. Um, some people do. Again, it depends on what country you're in. Some people will only save all their money in, in Bitcoin. It's just a little similar to gold. You know, a lot of people get confused when you say gold's nearly $3,000 an ounce because on the news, they always see that gold's $1,500 or $1,700 and it's always quoted in US dollars. And it's, that's the same for gold, um, oil, silver or, or Bitcoin. And then they see, oh, Bitcoin's $15,000 in Australia when it's on an exchange and they then they see $12,000 in America and they think about arbitrage and whatnot. So you really do have to understand the difference of a commodity or anything can be valued or denominated in its local currency. So that's it. that's where the price comes from. And yes, you can go in and out of Bitcoin into any currency in the world where there's an exchange. Yeah. And uh, Paul's just asked, can I ask you how transactions can be supported by the network once the 21 million cap is reached? Um, who will do the mining if they can't be rewarded? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So the first thing to know is that that won't happen for over another 100 years. So the inflation rate will, will keep uh, keep on flattening. So we'll worry about that more at the time. But the second part of the reward that Bitcoin miners get, so the inflation rate at the moment is uh, around 2%. And what that equals to, Martin, when you do the, the math is um, 6.25 Bitcoins in each block that they solve. Um so whatever the value of those are tends to go up over time as well. So as the number gets lower, the total actual value tends to go up. But they also get all the fees of those transactions in that block. So when I pay Martin, uh, I might pay one cent or 10 cent or maybe a dollar if the network's very busy or I'm sending a really large amount and I want it to be um, high priority um, transaction and process first. So you can pay those fees as well. And the miners get to keep all those fees that are in a block as well as the actual, uh, they call it a block reward, which is from the network, it's new coins, and that's the inflation rate. Right. Now, one of the questions I want to come to, Alex, is what is the value of Bitcoin? You know, it's quoted, as you say, against the dollar. It goes up and down. Um, the last two halvings, prices went up subsequent, maybe Maybe it will this time. But the point to make there is that the price of Bitcoin is actually determined by all the different exchanges. And there are actually are differences between the different exchanges, aren't there? Um, there are subtle differences. And I think I saw in the questions, Martin, um, someone was talking about arbitrage. So there's a few aspects to that. It's a little bit like saying um, maybe gold has diff slightly different prices in different countries. And in theory, maybe you could arbitrage it, but you've got to kind of travel to that other country because gold is a physical thing. So Bitcoin is somewhat similar. You'd have to send it to another exchange and that takes 10 minutes 
to get in the, the next transaction if you're lucky and the network's not busy. And then the exchange will want to um, confirm that. So maybe wait a few blocks. So you might actually have to wait half an hour or an hour for it to be confirmed. And you think of that as just double checking, I guess. So in that hour, Bitcoin's pretty volatile. It might have fluctuated a bit. So in theory, yes, there are subtle differences between exchanges, but it's also, again, a function of the difficulty to get money in and out of a country. So we might see that uh, gold is $1,500 or let's say $2,000 an ounce in Australia, but in Argentina, it might be trading at two and a half or $3,000 and it's got a premium there because you can try to do that arbitrage trade and then you'll go to get your money out of Argentina back to Australia and the banks will say no. Well, they'll give you a different exchange rate or there won't be enough liquidity or there's danger even going to that currency and trying to make the transaction. So in the real world, the game theory of it all, there's lots of sort of um, subtle nuances that make straight arbitrage actually more difficult than when you just see slight differences in price between exchanges. Okay. But ultimately, the value at any one time is effectively, it's a market discovery, isn't it? Supply, demand, demand, supply. And that's what creates the price. So in theory, yes. if everybody decided to sell on the same day, prices would drop. If everybody decided to buy on the same day, prices would go up a lot, right? And there's, there's nothing that actually anchors the price to anything else. It is actually, you know, just demand, supply, price discovery. Yes, sorry, that was the second part of the question I, I didn't uh, get to. Um, yes, it's like anything. You could say that, well, what is the actual value of gold? There's lots of people that are investing and they see it as a store of wealth and it's done that very well for thousands of years. Um, I should note that I'm actually still very bullish on gold and I think gold and Bitcoin have got different investment uh, cases because a lot of those two communities don't like each other very much if you followed Peter Schiff on uh, Twitter. So, yes, the Bitcoin value is derived from the buyers and sellers like anything in life. If a lot of people all of a sudden decide there's too much oil, the price went negative. If there's too many apples, you know, the supermarket puts the price down. So we, we think, and it's my belief, that the demand for Bitcoin comes from people that, that need it. And the people that need it have got different different needs. So if you're in Venezuela, you're trying to escape hyperinflation. And that is the only way for you to store your money without being you know, inflated away. And we, we hear these stories all the time. We often get so focused on Australia or America, but we hear these stories all the time of people that have their life savings taken away from them overnight. There was another country the other day that just revalued their currency down 40% overnight. Or you'll go to the bank and they'll say, no, that's you know, in Turkey, and they'll say, no, that's the that's the street exchange rate. This is the government exchange rate that we're paying you. So there's a lot of places out there that just don't have a fair fiat currency system. Now, there's other places in the world that won't let you send money over a border or from one person to another or businesses, tattoo parlors or even cryptocurrency exchanges and businesses, banks won't deal with them. Um, you guys have done a lot of episodes, Martin, about all this. So if we go to these entire digital Aussie dollar systems, the new payments platform and the like, if a business can't get a bank account and they fall through the cracks, these big banks don't really care about the fringe use cases. If they don't meet the criteria, it's just bad luck. So all around the world, there are people that can just download this software on their phone or their home computer and they now have a way to store value in a digital bank account with different cryptocurrencies. You know, if they don't like the volatility of Bitcoin, they can choose those digital stable coins, which we might get to later as well. But there are so many reasons why different people um, need, need Bitcoin, as well as the speculation and the trading and some people that come here because they, they want to get rich and they think it will go up in value. There's actually a lot of, of real use case. And the, the best example is for anyone that wants to send money overseas, it costs you... $50 at ComBank to send international money transfer to you know another European country and it will take 10 days to get there and you'll look at the exchange rate and they'll actually give you a 10% spread and you know compared to a Bitcoin transaction you can send, with, um, send for one cent. It, it just doesn't compare. It's just so much better. Yeah, and I remember speaking to the CEO of one of the exchanges very recently. In fact, it shows up on my 
her channel at the moment. And what she said was, remember, we're very early in the evolution cycle here. You know, this is, hasn't been running that long. And, you know, rather than assume that we've seen all the potential and all of the opportunity, you know, we're probably very early in the cycle. And I think that's something that people need to bear in mind. It's not like this is a, a fully matured, you know, completely bolted down thing it's evolving and developing and it's you know morphing into into different uh, shapes and sizes based on uh, you know what's going to happen into the future um there is a very high speculative element in there and you know i, I will say and i keep saying be careful with this because it is speculative you know it might go up might go down um mm -hmm. but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's evil um you know and um yes. <laughs> frankly there's less um, central bank interve intervention on Bitcoin at the moment than there is on, <laughs> on most other uh, currencies, particularly now. Um, but I guess that takes us to an interesting um, uh, couple of points, uh, Alex. The first is there is, of course, other flavours of cryptos, and, right? and there are others that are actually decentralised and devolved. And then there yeah. are flavours like central bank digital currencies, which are being experimented with, where the central banks are actually controlling effectively a digital version of their own currency. And we've mm. even got things like Facebook and Libra, which is essentially a, an asset-backed digital currency. So we've got this yeah. constellation at the moment of different flavours and different types of crypto. And I'd be interested to get your perspective on where you see Bitcoin vis-a-vis -vis these other constellation. You know, is Bitcoin going to be out evolved by some of these other things or is it going to be yeah. still, you know, the major force within it? Or do you think central bank digital currencies could overtake it? What do you think? Yeah, I think you've touched on some really important stuff there, Martin. So firstly, I'd probably say that Bitcoin is very similar to the Internet when it came out in the mid 90s or whatever, when it was very slow kind of clunky to use if you weren't tech savvy typing in an address and all that it was just so new for everyone and that's very similar to bitcoin so when people say oh it's a bit slow it's a bit clunky it's difficult to use i heard i heard this happened i heard there was a bad website it's kind of like the internet in the early days where it's all that's all pretty true but these things will evolve and the developers because there's no one company in charge there's no bitcoin headquarters or a bitcoin team it's open source, so anyone can can work on the software and propose improvements. Martin or I can do that if we want to. And it's up to the whole network to agree that, yes, that's the best thing for the network. And the whole network's only ever going to agree when something is very safe and, and worth the change. So that's why Bitcoin moves very slow. It's almost become a feature uh, rather than other cryptocurrencies that are experimenting and trying new technology. And that can often lead to bugs or mistakes. It doesn't function as it's intended to. So that's that's kind of where these different flavors of cryptocurrency started. But in terms of Bitcoin, you can definitely think of it as taking it being slow because the net value, the market cap now is $150, $200 billion. You don't want to say, oh, whoops, we shouldn't have done that upgrade. Sorry, guys, there was a bug. You know, there's a lot at stake now. So they are taking it slow. And they actually have absorbed or taken changes from other projects once they become tried and tested. So that's how Bitcoin's roadmap looks going forward. There's a lot of ways. And in the next 12 to 24 months, you're going to see significant improvements um, in things like Bitcoin even becoming more private at the moment. It's kind of private. It's kind of not. If I know Martin's address, his Bitcoin address, it doesn't actually have Martin's name attached to it. But if Martin sends me coins from that address, then I can forever say, well, I know that that's Martin's address. And I can go and check up how many coins he's got a year later and say, geez, Martin's done well. He's bought some more Bitcoins. So that's where the kind of, they call it pseudonymous um, Bitcoin public ledger comes from. Because there are websites that are like Google, like a search engine where you can paste someone's transaction number or their wallet address and it'll tell you the history because it's a public open ledger so those other flavors martin yes they started off as sort of copycats of bitcoin and a few clones um, a bit faster a bit more private uh, another funky feature here or there but then it really expanded to the blockchain technology so what else can can the blockchain do and the ideas that are good applications i believe are things that are need to be distributed and decentralized and cutting out the middleman. So finance is one that's really exploded lately. Hopefully in the future, we'll be able to trade shares and take out loans and not pay a, the bank a big fee every time we, we do something like that. So we'll be peer-to-peer -peer trading. And just like 
I guess Uber and Airbnb really shook things up by coming out with these apps that cut out the middleman or the corporation in the middle and, and make things more peer-to-peer. That's what a lot of cryptocurrency uh, blockchain-style projects are trying to do. Now, that's very experimental. Uh, there's 10,000 or more out there now, and I thoroughly believe that 99.9% of those are going to fail. So very similar to the dot-com bubble. But I also believe that there's... 20, 30, maybe 100, we just don't know, that will come out with very interesting ideas. Now, whether or not that means that they are also a good investment is another question altogether uh, because you're not buying equity or stake in a company. You're not buying the shares. You're buying a token on that network that allows you to, to do certain things. So it's trying to have intrinsic value through the utility. So that's where it gets a little bit more complicated and I very much think that most people should just start with Bitcoin and get your head around that first before you go you know, speculating on these other coins. Yeah, and I'll just add that you know, central bank digital currencies are definitely emerging. There are banks around the world testing them at the moment and that's something that I think people need to be conscious of. I see there's going to be a tussle ahead between the decentralized, devolved Bitcoins that aren't within the money system, as it were, in terms of control, and essentially the others that are outside uh, that, inside the government control, the banks control. And central banks are definitely positioning to create their own alternatives, digital currencies that are essentially within the control so that they can can control flow, money laundering, and all of those things. So that's the first point, right? And the second point is, of course, that uh, people like Libra are looking at flavors of uh, of digital currency backed by you know a basket of other currencies. So there's a, there's a big constellation. One of the uh, questions that War- Warren actually asked is, do you foresee government seizing control of cryptocurrencies in the future like they have with gold in the past? And I'll give you my view and then you can come in, Alex. Just quickly, do you want me to address the stable coins? I did miss those. So uh, just quickly, yeah, we've got a lot of different... Um, flavors of these coins that are pegged to the traditional currencies. So for many years, there's been uh, Tether you might have heard of, but these stable coins that are pegged to different currencies. And there's already actually a few Aussie dollar stable coins. So anyone can make something and and peg it to that value. But now you're putting your trust in that company that they're keeping $1 in the bank for every dollar of digital coin that they issue. So that's where trust comes into it. And there's a lot of scams out there in the cryptocurrency world that are making uh, gold-backed coins. And I've seen a lot in Australia where people think that they're buying gold or oil-backed coins and they, they're they being told on these websites that they're making interest every month and whatnot, but it's all just you know scams. They're not backed by anything. But then you have someone like um, the Perth Mint, Ainsley Bullion have got a gold and silver coin and they're reputable Aussie bullion dealers that have got a trusted track record and they're huge company. So someone like that you would trust to buy the digital coin because they've got an ounce of gold for every ounce token that they they make and put out there. Then you've got all these different countries around the world. The Petro have got their own coin. Uh, Facebook wanted to make Libra. They want to make that a basket of coins. They recently actually changed that. So they're going to have all the different currencies as one. The US are sort of on the race to make the digital dollar because they're very jealous of China that are very close to launching the digital yuan. But these don't really have any of those properties that we spoke about at the start that make Bitcoin great. So you and I can't download the the China yuan wallet and we can't start tinkering or proposing changes or mining the coins. It's basically just the same as currencies these days that are digital it'll be a database that the government has control of instead of the bank having control of the database at the moment and they'll monitor everything you do yeah and that's really the point right so if you listen to the central bankers you know a lot of them are saying we have to get control we have to be able to control money laundering and all of those things so so the very archetypal positioning vis-a-vis the decentralized no control of, of, of the cryptocurrencies is what central banks are on about and what they're really doing is trying to reinforce their own position and essentially make sure that uh, they can keep <laughs> their place in the value chain right that's what it's about that was interesting last year at jackson hole um, the ex um, bank of england chief um, actually said that he considered that one of the potential options would be um, a digital currency that would ultimately replace the dollar as a reserve currency, which I thought was really interesting. So, you know, there are a lot of different uh, permutations and 
and opportunities. But I think there's going to be a big tussle ahead as to centralise, decentralise, central bank versus not. And uh, too yeah. soon to say it's going to play out. It's probably going to be a constellation ultimately, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. A few weeks ago, I did a video. On, I'm not sure how much you've read about this US dollar milkshake theory, Martin, where the US dollar is just getting stronger and stronger because there's so much debt around the world and it's all denominated in US dollars. A lot of these developing nations have borrowed in, in dollars. So to pay that back, you always need more dollars. So there's a huge demand all around the world for these dollars. And all the other local currencies are just going down and down in value. I mean, even the Aussie dollar has gone from a dollar ten, what uh, ten years ago or so, down to fifty-five cents. It hit, so it lost half its value in that period of time. Now, that's obviously, I guess, cherry picking a little bit. But if you look at all currencies around the world, they've gone down against the US dollar. Gold, you know, everything has gone down against the US dollar compared to these other currencies around the world. So I very much believe in that US dollar theory and we've had mark carney from the bank of england come out and say that the us has too many privileges for having the world reserve currency you know all this oil trading this this debt situation particularly becoming apparent at the moment when they're printing trillions and trillions but the currency is still going up because all that money a lot of it is just going to these other countries and they're selling their currency to buy more, more US dollars. So I think that is probably the biggest investment theme of the next few years is how does that play out? Does it stay civil? Because we know China and Russia and all these other guys want to get rid of the US dollar and dethrone it. They were stockpiling gold. Do some of those maybe start saying, well, hey, maybe Bitcoin's another shot at just a death by a thousand cuts. It's probably not going to ever replace gold or their own currencies. But anything they can do to try and give people another option other than the US dollar is better for them. I think it's sort of economic warfare. Yeah, no, good point. Uh, and I'll just make the point that Dean actually said, um, Ben Bernanke after the GFC, um, you know, said, we'll update the accounts on the computer. So in other words, you know, they just made the numbers bigger, right? What's the difference with Bitcoin? Maybe not a lot other than one is controlled by the Fed versus decentralized. So there are some strong parallels between how Bitcoin functions and how central bank currencies function? Well, to answer that question, if you or I and the other million people around the world that have invested in Bitcoin or are using Bitcoin, Martin, if someone proposes that improvement that says, hey, we should print more Bitcoins, and all those million people say, well, why would we do that? That'll devalue our coins. That proposal will never get through. So in theory, if you can convince everyone that's invested in Bitcoin that it's good to dilute their investment, devalue it, then in theory, you could maybe upgrade it. But even then, you've got to get them all to download the software and upgrade their computers. So no one is ever going to agree to do something that's bad for Bitcoin. Yeah, they've got a mutual interest, right? And because it's devolved and because effectively everybody has a say, it's much more democratic than central bank behavior at the moment. Absolutely, absolutely. None of us chose to uh, print a few more trillion, Martin. And even the central bank governor in the US rolled out the other day and said, go in and take out as much money as you want. They wanted to really calm people's fear of bank runs and bail-ins. And they said, we will print as much as we need to. Congress have told us to. So I thought bail-ins were a fairly big threat that we've both done plenty of videos on. But now I actually think that they're just going to print to oblivion and uh, governments don't need to take our gold or our our bitcoin office because they've they've got a printing press that's just digital these days well it's clear to me that they've just gone doing that for uh, forever um i see there's a couple of comments on the uh, audio uh, levels um i can confirm that they are looking fine here so i don't think it's a, a source problem um now a couple of questions that uh, we wanted to move to one is bitcoin's price at the moment is around eight us about eight thousand plus a month it's a bit right it was up to 10 it came back again um the last couple of times there was a halving there was a significant spike up after so you know what's the what's the sense of people expecting the same again or do you think because of the quantitative easing and everything else is going on at the moment and covid we might not see the same this time or does anybody know uh no i, I don't think you can compare it to those early days at all i just think so much has changed I actually do think Bitcoin follows that um, Wall Street cheat sheet pattern you've seen with the, the boom and bust cycles because so much of it is driven on speculation. And I do believe it's going to a larger market cap over time because it, you know, a $100 billion market cap is still relatively small compared to all these other currencies we talk about. Gold, um, Forex reserves, any type of meaningful currency, 
and that path there is not going to be a straight line. So it's always going to have times when it goes up, people feel like they've made money and they'll want to sell. That tends to end in people hearing about Bitcoin and retail excitement and, and euphoria and we have another bubble. Then that pops and people get you know, fearful and they sell and it goes down sharply. So that's happened over and over. We've probably had three or four big cycles and probably eight um, sort of in between cycles, I guess you'd say 40 or 50% corrections. So Bitcoin is very volatile because of uh, all the trading that happens on the exchanges, their high leverage. Um, there's a lot of money out there. Anyone can get 100x leverage these days. There's, there are whales out there with a lot of Bitcoins um, that like to push the market around. But over time, it's the value and the use that has actually been a fairly steady line if you look at the growth on an exponential log chart over time. Yeah. And the I guess the other point to make is that you know, there is also a generational thing going on here, right? So as younger people come up, they're more comfortable with digital and digitalization. You know, they use their devices more. So there's 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 a natural migration to the digital world already happening. And, and so, you know, every decade or so, you're going to get more and more people just used to this sort of stuff. And essentially, it will just be part of the furniture. Uh, particularly in developing nations, there's one exchange, Binance, which is one of the biggest in the world, that have really aggressively gone to different countries. Today, they announced Indonesia, um, population over 250 million people. And we just forget the, the population and their currency isn't strong. You know, they don't have the US dollar or, or a euro, even an Aussie dollar. They don't have something they can be reasonably confident in that isn't going to get inflated away when they have a big economic recession or depression like we could go into now. So all of a sudden, for the first time in history, we've got you know, 90% of these people have a smartphone now and they've got 4G or you know, maybe even 5G internet, which I know um, people aren't too keen on, but we won't get into that tonight, Martin. But um, yeah, it's very easy within a few clicks for people to get access to software and uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, but come their own bank account. In some of these countries, they don't have banks. So just like we had countries that skipped um telephone infrastructure and went straight to mobile phones we're going to have countries that skip banks and just go straight to you know digital world and becoming their own bank there, there was a good comment i saw martin that um someone said you don't want a currency to be volatile and that's it's a good point i still think relative bitcoin will be get less volatile over time so in the future the next correction might only be 30 percent and then 20%. And there's plenty of global currencies in the top 10 that move that much. But once we get to the figure where I think we're going, it'll settle down even more. It's just when it's growing so aggressively and so quickly, that's when we have the, you know, the selling, the profit taking, the human emotions come into it. But once I think we're going to get to that uh, large market cap, then it will settle down. Yeah. And, you know, nobody quite knows when or how, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what I said earlier on about it's early in the evolutionary path. Uh, but there are some characteristics that we've discussed that make it, I think, quite uh, attractive for the future. And particularly, I come back to this digital. So I survey households all the time, and the, the number who are younger are digitally enabled and just familiar with this stuff now means it's going to become more and more and more critical going forward, I think. Um, okay, yeah. now, what else should we cover, Alex? Um, I think I've done pretty much all the questions that we had beforehand, and I've just been looking down the, the chat, and I think I've probably knocked most of them over. Um, I will just acknowledge Nico, James, uh, and Lewis, who also uh, made contributions. So thank you for that, and I appreciate that. It all helps to uh, keep the uh, the shows on the road. Um, I guess I think the, the risks, man. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> you took the words out of my mouth. Well, I was going to say <laughs> before we finish. I do think we need to come back onto the risk area, right? And I think there's a yeah. couple of dimensions to that. Firstly, of course, about wallets, and the second is about exchanges. And uh, you know, we do hear about uh, exchanges falling over, keys being lost people losing money, being defrauded of money. What's the story? What's the truth of this, Alex? What's the truth of it? So it is a, like any investment, it can be very risky and no one knows there's a chance that it could go to zero. So what a lot of people, Paul Tudor Jones the other day, you know, world famous fund manager, I think he said he's got a low single digit in his fund. So for him, he might be viewing that 1%, 3% or 5% is a good risk to reward for him and his clients. So that's what a lot of people that we um, talk to and, and help, they sort of think of that number as a good risk to reward. If it really goes to zero, it doesn't matter. There's a lot of potential upside asymmetry. 
uh, there. Now, other people that are younger might be happy to speculate and they might only have a lowish amount of money and they might not care if that goes to zero. It might be their best shot at turning $1,000 into twenty or $30,000 in the next few years. You know, that's up to you to decide that, that risk to reward. But once you've made that decision, there's a lot of other risks that people make. So whenever we have the big run-ups in price, that's when the most new people tend to come in and they buy at the wrong time. So you've got to sort of look at the charts and saying, hey, am I just buying with FOMO because everyone's telling me I need to buy um, or should I wait till when it's pulled back a little bit or gone sideways and whatnot? But then if you sign up to a dodgy exchange, you can do everything that you think is right and you've handed over your money or your Bitcoin to someone you don't know online. So only ever use things that you know are trusted and, and reputable don't go to a dodgy website just because it, they say they might save you a little bit in fees or a deal that's too good to be true always is in this space. And then there's a lot of scams that promise you these monthly returns. So sign up, you know, send us your Bitcoin, sign up your friends, you'll get 5% a month, 10% a month. I've done a lot of videos on this, but there are just so many scams time and time again. So learn how to store the Bitcoin yourself because if you've got it um, at home in your own computer your own hardware wallet a little usb sticks you can buy that keep the bitcoin keys on them that way it can't get hacked if you it's a bit different to your shares where you know you can leave your password lying around for your shares account i guess but you can't really send someone shares to someone else in crypto land you can so if you leave your password around or someone hacks your computer or they get onto your hard drive where you've got your bitcoin stored any way that someone gets access to your Bitcoins, they just send them to themselves and they're gone forever. So online um, security is just so, so important with strong passwords and two-factor authentication app on your phone, um, learning, up, learning how to set up one of those hardware wallets. And the next step is businesses that do custody for you, custody and insurance, like we see some gold miners, um, gold precious metals dealers will do that unallocated and allocated bullion in their vaults and store it safely for you. Yeah, and uh, as with everything, you know, cold is offline is probably better than online because at least you've got more control over it, but it's just a little less accessible when you need it. So that's always the the, the trade. There was another question here, Martin, about the forks. Have you said you got that one? Um, it's a good point that always comes up when people say, well, you can't print more Bitcoin, but you can fork fork it off. And a fork means basically copying the the code and because it's all open source anyone can copy that code so we can have martin's bitcoin or bitcoin nugget and we can basically do that and it's up to everyone if they decide that that has value or not now some people decided that they wanted uh, bitcoin to go in another direction and try a different feature and since then we've had about a hundred bitcoin forks you might hear of the biggest one or two but there's actually you know over a hundred now, most of those have no value whatsoever. But if there's a segment of the community, 5%, that decide that they think that that Bitcoin is best, then that segment can sort of take 5% of the market share or market cap with it. But that's only because those people that believe in it are paying that price. So when people say forking is diluting it, it's just not true. You can you know, go to a gold mine and say, hey, I found this other metal. It's just as good. Pay me you know, $1,700 an ounce like gold and people are going to look at you funny. So you can fork Bitcoins as many times as you want, but it doesn't have any value. It's not going to go on exchanges. People aren't going to pay you money for it. <laughs> yep, exactly right. Very interesting. And um, uh, I see somebody's asked to hear, how do we reach mass, mass adoption? It's an interesting question. You know, is it just going to happen naturally over time? Like, you know, the generational shift? Um, is it going to come from, um, you know, a, a new commercial reality? You know, are we going to see a failure of, you know, on more, on more normal currencies? You could argue that the, <laughs> the, what the Fed is doing is devaluing, you know, the, re, the, the real value of the dollar. Um, yeah. It's going to be an interesting question. How do we reach mass adoption? I don't think there's a lot you can do other than to educate people and it will happen naturally. So it's actually a harder proposal for people in Australia because they've got pay pass, they've got bank accounts that are reasonably safe and inflation that hasn't been too high, some people would argue. But if you're in Argentina, Venezuela, some of those countries are already seeing you know, reports of 40 or 50% of people transacting in Bitcoin or other stable cryptocurrencies. 
because it's just the best thing for them. So market demand, like any good products, you know, once you have something that's better than the current system, then people will use it. Now, the big step that I think is going to be that the biggest driver of Bitcoin adoption is once the last couple of countries get negative interest rates. So the market started pricing that in in America the other day. And when the world reserve currency now has negative interest rates on their dollars, but also their bonds, these are huge markets, you know, tens of trillions of dollars of money that says, okay, well, let's, where else can we find a home for this money? Now, that's why gold's got, performed so well because it's got 0% yield, which people complain about, but 0% starts to look very good once you're at minus whatever interest rate. And I think so does Bitcoin. Other reasons are bank fragility. So we're still having countries with very weak banks, uh, bail-ins. Even just the other day when we had the, the system go down and, and trading stop and investment funds that say you can't withdraw, I think we're going to go to this sort of region of different cryptocurrencies as well as Bitcoin where the, having the custody of the own assets is going to trade at a premium. So not having to worry about a bank fail or something get hacked or, you know, you being told that you can't access your own wealth. I think that is really important going forward as well as the 24-hour nature. So in future, you know, a digital world, who's to say that something doesn't happen, a big world event on a Saturday or Sunday and gold jumps at market open on Monday, but being able to move your wealth from risky to a stable coin or you might have all your assets in stocks and you say, I want to move into a stable coin or gold on a Saturday or Sunday night. So cryptocurrencies and open ledgers are going to just open up 24-7 trading. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that, uh, you know, over the weekend and what have you. And I guess, you know, it comes back to the unknown unknown, right? Is the future going to be inflationary or deflationary? We've discussed this on a couple of, uh, of, of the shows on, the, on your channel and the economics, right? And it's hard to, to, to call. I can you know, line up people who think the, the future is going to be very inflationary, in which case bitcoins and gold are a very good hedge. Or it could be very deflationary and look at Japan, in which case um, they might not be as good compared with other things. So in a way, that, that spectrum is the problem because nobody knows where on the spectrum we're going to be. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. What I would say is at the moment, it looks like they're going to fight that tooth and nail with money printing. I think central banks have got a probably bigger headache if they let deflation take hold. So even just the step up, like it amazes me what happened at the GFC, $700 billion Congress passes it. There was a lot of back and forth. I think it got rejected initially. And then we had Occupy Wall Street and there was a lot of people that got angry about that. A lot of documentaries made it dies off for 10 years and we were joking on the channel that look at the amount of bonds and whatnot they would have to do a trillion dollars a month of qe if things get nasty here and at one point they were doing you know trillions of dollars a week so it is just insane the amount of money printing that's happening but they're passing it off like it's normal they're trying to save face but i think we both know that that debt-based monetary system that has to expand it bigger and bigger it can't just go on like this. You can't get to the point where it's a trillion dollars a day and every second day the Fed are trying to, you know, stop the, the leaking of the boat. So I think Bitcoin is kind of revealing the weaknesses in the traditional financial system. Yeah, well, we'll know in a few years' time, Alex, which way it, uh, it, it peels off. But uh, certainly the central banks and their quantitative easing and money printing is, is a big worry and I've done sh a number of shows on that because it really is creating uh, you know huge waves and of course the trouble is a lot of it isn't supporting the real economy it's just supporting the the financial system as we as we've said before well we're yes, pretty much absolutely. Up, up to the hour um let me just uh, see whether there are any other questions that we've not um touched on i was just going to say guys for anyone that's interested in more we've got free information uh, on our website. Uh, if you want to learn more and you've got family and friends, particularly that are beginners or might be looking at scams, we've got all that information to keep them safe over at nuggetsnews.com.au. For that, and it's worth saying, I think Endeavor Webs has said, Bitcoin is a religion. <laughs> and and there, is, there is a certain further around it, right? I get this on my channel all the time because, you know, I got asked earlier on, do you believe in Bitcoin? And I, I mean, that's a really interesting question philosophically, right? Um, yeah, uh, and, we, and I think we've discussed some of the par parameters and characteristics of Bitcoin, but I don't know whether I believe or don't believe in Bitcoin. It exists. Um, so I'm not sure what the question really means. But there is a, there are a lot of people who actually are extremely 
uh, you know, volatile and religiously fervent about Bitcoin. I think that's quite interesting. Oh, definitely. To, and there's spectrums in that as well. So there are people that only believe in Bitcoin and, and won't talk to other people that like other coins. There are people that are very tribal about their own coin that's not Bitcoin. And then there are people, hopefully like myself, that are a bit more neutral and open to everything, keep an open mind. But um, yes, there are people that are tribal about it. And then there's even subgenres. So there's you know, areas of Bitcoiners that that only eat meat, and all like it's just yeah, at the cutting edge of technology in this digital world where people are living online, Martin. There's um, always going to be different factions. But I guess you can argue that people thought silver bugs or gold bugs were weird. You know, people that only invest in uranium, and you know, there's I guess there's all people that like their own different collection. So. Yeah, well, you know, it's what try. It's a bit like what football team you support, isn't it? It's the same sort of fervor, right? Which is quite yes. often there. Well, Alex, yeah. I appreciate your time tonight. Um, it's been fantastic. We should say this hasn't been financial advice. Um, you know, this is just a general conversation. Um, so please don't to rush out and buy Bitcoin on the back of this conversation. Get real advice. It's really, really important. But I think this is yeah. a really important topic. And uh, maybe what we should uh, do a bit down the track is to come back and have a more detailed conversation about some of those other flavors of coin i mean there are lots of different flavors we haven't been able to touch on today because i think people might be interested in that too but uh, uh thank you for your time thanks to the viewers it's been um a, a great uh, event we've had more than 500 on at, uh, at the peak there so that's terrific and uh, thank you for all those who've um uh, uh, demonstrated support to the channel tonight it's been great and um if you want more information about digital finance loops you know where to come you know we've got a lot of stuff there you I'll put links to Alex's site there too. He's got a lot of material, really interesting uh, material there too. And Alex, we'll uh, catch up again soon. And uh, I guess our next conversation is going to be an economic uh, review in a few weeks' time on your channel. I look forward to it, Martin. And I know everyone appreciates it when you come and help us out as well. So hopefully I've given everyone some value tonight. And uh, yeah, let us know if there's other topics we can cover next time. So thanks, Martin. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to switch back to my main stream and then I'm going to run my DFA outro just to say good night, everybody. Thanks, Alex, and have a good evening. See ya.